Welcome to the Stations of the Cross online. This service, presented by Ian Guy at the Wakatipu Presbyterian Church, is largely adapted from material provided by illustrativeministry.com. As you start this service, I suggest you gather some resources. You will need a pen and paper. It'd be nice to have a candle, which you have lit, a bowl of water, a little salt, and uh, maybe pause this as you go off and find those. Pen and paper, a lit candle, a bowl of water or a glass, and a little bit of salt. You go away and find that and come back in a moment. Today we enter into this time of worship, a time in which we draw near to Christ at the cross through these series of stations. Our first station is sorrow. Then Jesus went with them to a place called Gethsemane, and he said to his disciples, Sit here while I go over there and pray. He took with him Peter and the two sons of Zebedee and began to be grieved and agitated. Then he said to them, I am deeply grieved even to death. Remain here and stay awake with me. And going a little farther, he threw himself on the ground and prayed, My father, if it is possible, let this cup pass from me. Yet not what I want, but what you want. Then he came to the disciples and found them sleeping. And he said to Peter, So could you not stay awake with me one hour? Stay awake and pray that you may not come into the time of trial. The spirit indeed is willing, but the flesh is weak. Tonight, or at this time, as we begin this journey for the stations of the cross, and, rem and remember the disciples who came with Jesus to the garden, remember also those people who have accompanied you during your hardest times. Maybe like the disciples who were present with Jesus, the people you will remember were also struggling. Maybe like the disciples, they faced their own sorrow or couldn't completely enter into yours but still came alongside you. To begin, call to mind the face of one person who has been present with you in difficulty or sorrow. Picture that face before you. Hold your focus there for a moment. And then as you contemplate that person, Turn to God in prayer and say, thank you. A simple thank you, a prayer of gratitude, not for this person's perfection, but for their presence, for their willing spirit. We remember that as we journey through these stations and as you journey through your life, you are held carefully and prayerfully by your community. Betrayal. Immediately while he was still speaking, Judas, one of the twelve, arrived, and with him there was a crowd of swords and clubs from the chief priests, the scribes, and the elders. Now the betrayer had given them a sign saying, The one I will kiss is a man, arrest him, and lead him away under guard. So when he came, he went up to him at once and said, Rabbi, and kissed him. Then they laid hands on him and arrested him. As you remember the story of Judas, a faithful friend who turned Jesus over to the authorities, consider the ways you have sometimes rejected what matters most to you. Join me in a time of prayer. I'll speak the prompt, leave some silence for you to call to mind your own confession, and then together we'll say, Loving God, I confess, and I call on your grace. 
So let's pray. God, this story is difficult. It asks us to remember a heartbreaking time in the life of Jesus and confront times in our own lives where we have betrayed what matters most. Hear us now in these silences as we offer our confessions to you. For the ways I have betrayed the court to, to do justly, to love mercy and to walk humbly with you. Loving God, I confess and I call on your grace. For the ways I have betrayed my call to embrace all your children. Loving God, I confess and I call on your grace. For the ways I have betrayed my own identity as your beloved child. Loving God, I confess and I call on your grace. Loving God, for all of this we confess and we call on your grace. Amen. Condemnation When day came, the assembly of the elders of the people, both chief priests and scribes, gathered together, and they brought him to their council. They said, If you are the Messiah, tell us. He replied, If I tell you, you will not believe, and if I question you, you will not answer. But from now on, the Son of Man will be seated at the right hand of the power of God. One of them asked, Are you then the Son of God? He said to them, You say that I am. Then they said, What further testimony do we need? We've heard it ourselves from his own lips. As you remember the condemnation in the story, which is really a confession, really a promise, that Jesus is the Son of God, take a moment to remember and reflect on the promise that you too are God's child. Whatever any other voice, your own, <coughs> your own or someone else's might tell you, this identity means remains the deepest truth about you and about everyone else you will ever meet. We are all children of God and we can know that as we receive Christ as our Lord. So right now, breathe in deeply and breathe out slowly. And place your lips, your hands on your lips, saying, with these lips I will speak God's truth. Once again, breathe in deeply and breathe out slowly. Fold your hands together. Say aloud, with these hands I will serve God's world. Again, breathe in deeply and breathe out slowly. Place your hands on your heart, say aloud, with all I am, I will share God's love. And finally, breathe in deeply, breathe out slowly. Place your hands on your head, say aloud, I will trust in the Lord Jesus Christ. I will remember, I am God's own. Denial. Now Peter was sitting outside in the courtyard. A servant girl came to him and said, you also were with Jesus, the Galilean. But he denied it before all of them, 
saying, I do not know what you are talking about. When he went out to the porch, another servant girl saw him, and she said to the bystanders, This man was with Jesus of Nazareth. Again he denied it with an oath, I do not know the man. After a little while, the bystanders came up and said to Peter, Certainly you are also one of them, for your accent betrays you. Then he began to curse, and he swore on an oath, I do not know the man. At that moment the rooster crowed. Then Peter remembered what Jesus had said. Before the rooster crows, you will deny me three times. And he went out and wept bitterly. We can imagine Peter's denial of Jesus breaking Jesus' heart. And we can see it breaks Peter's heart too. But it's not the whole story. Here Peter says no. No, I don't know him. No, he's not my friend. No, I'm not part of what's happening here. Peter denies Jesus, and when he does, he also denies himself. Because before this, Peter had been saying yes to Jesus. He's been saying yes to the call to discipleship, yes to this journey toward the unknown, yes to trusting in the promises of God and the hope of God's kingdom here on earth. These yeses mean he's been saying no in other ways. No to despair. No to injustice. No to a community where not all are recognised as beloved. Here, Peter's fear gets the best of him. It convinces him to say no to what he's been saying yes to for so long. It convinces him to deny what he trusts and who he is. Think of a yes you have said that is central to your identity. Write it down. Find that bit of paper. Then fold up that paper small enough to carry in your pocket. When our time together ends, carry it with you. Whenever you, your fear threatens, unfold this paper. Let your re-reading and remembering of this yes give you the courage to know who you are, even in the face of your fear. Judgment. As soon as it was morning, the chief priests held a consultation with the elders and scribes and the whole council. They bound Jesus, led him away, and handed him over to Pilate. Pilate asked him, Are you the king of the Jews? He answered, You say so. Then the chief priests accused him of many things. Pilate asked him again, Have you no answer? See how many charges they bring against you. But Jesus made no further reply, so that Pilate was amazed. So Pilate, wishing to satisfy the crowd, released Barabbas for them. And after flogging Jesus, he handed him over to be crucified. Pilate begins quite well. He begins with a curious mind. He's asking questions. He begins in that space where anything is possible, where truth may be heard. He does not stay there long. It's a hard place to stay, especially when easy answers are being shouted all around, demanding attention, demanding action. What if we could stay in that place of openness, of questioning? What if we could remain in the wondering about Jesus, about ourselves, about each other, before we rushed to judgment, or instead of going to judgment at all. In the silence, you are invited to call to mind someone that you have a judgment about. Think for a moment about the things you've already decided are true about that person. And now, if you can, and ask God for some help with this, set those decisions aside and begin to ask questions 
Let any question, every question come to your mind. Give yourself and the person you are remembering the gift of your wondering. Let yourself be curious about them. This curiosity, this openness, this wondering is a kindness. It can change us. It can change our world. Let us remain open to one another and not rush to judgment. Crowning. Then Pilate took Jesus and had him flogged. And the soldiers wove a crown of thorns and put it on his head. And they dressed him in a purple robe. They kept coming up to him saying, Hail, King of the Jews, and striking him on the face. When the soldiers place a crown on Jesus' head and drape a robe over his shoulders, they do so in mockery. They twist these gestures of honour and turn them into acts of ridicule and shame. Earlier in the week, a woman anointed Jesus with oil, a sign of blessing. Later, after he is crucified, a woman will come to the tomb with spices, again to offer a blessing to his body. Our bodies are sights of so much. Often we carry honour and shame in the same spaces, even at the same time. Sometimes our bodies are sights of pleasure and delight. Sometimes they carry pain and suffering. Like it was with, with Jesus, our bodies can be how we know blessing and how we know sorrow. It's important to pause and recognize our bodies as God-given and that they are sacred. It is important to honor them. Take a deep breath in. Let it out slowly. Become aware of your own body. What do you notice? Is there, is there any part of you that feels strong? Is there any part that you experience pain? Linger where you need to. Take another deep breath in. Let this one out slowly too. Settle deeper into awareness of your body. Place your hands on the part of your body you would like to bless. Maybe your feet for the journeys ahead. Maybe your, your hands for the work they will do. Maybe on your head for greater understanding or over your heart for healing of a hurt. Give thanks for the gift that is your body. Remember you are wonderfully made. Remember God dwells with you and lives through you too. Bearing. When the chief priests and the police saw him, they shouted, Crucify him, crucify him. Pilate said to them, Take him yourselves and crucify him. I find no case against him. They cried out, Away with him, away with him, crucify him. Pilate asked them, Shall I crucify your king? The chief priest answered, We have no king but the emperor. Then he handed him over to them to be crucified. So they took Jesus, and carrying the cross by himself, he went out to what is called the place of the skull, which in Hebrew is called Golgotha. And now we meet Jesus bearing the cross by himself. But the story of the cross will come to be about all of us. The story is about Jesus and the people surrounding him, about the 
God, about the God he cries out to, about everyone who comes after and calls on his name. The shape of the cross evokes the suspensive notion. One line reaches down, right into the depths of who we are. One line reaches out to include each and every one of us. Draw a cross on your paper. Trace it with your finger. Follow the line reaching down and then the line reaching out. Trace it again. Imagine the line reaching down as God's gift to us. Imagine the line reaching out as our condition of need. Trace it again. Imagine the cross as a place where God's mercy meets our ignorance. Trace it again. Imagine the cross as a place where God's compassion meets our arrogance. Trace it again. Imagine the cross as a place where God's embrace counters our fear. Trace it one more time. Remember that in the life of Jesus and in his bearing of the cross, our deepest needs are met by God's deep, ever faithful love for you. Helping. They compelled a passerby who was coming in from the country to carry his cross. It was Simon of Cyrene, the father of Alexandra and Rufus. We don't know why Simon was chosen from the crowd to help carry the cross. We don't know what his connection to Jesus or to this movement might have been before this moment, why he was passing by, what he knew of the events unfolding, but he was conscripted to join in, and he did, in a different way than many of the others gathered. With angry voices and violent threats being raised all around them, Simon simply came alongside Jesus. Simon took some of the burden from Jesus, shifting the weight of the cross onto his own shoulders. What a gift that must have been to Jesus. Do you know someone carrying a heavy burden now? Someone weighed down by struggle? Maybe it is a close friend or family member. Maybe it's someone you've only heard about or seen on the news. But choose someone and come alongside them in prayer in this moment. You do not need to know all the details of their pain to help to hold them in your heart. Spend a moment in silence, centering yourself in the story that you are remembering, calling to mind the person you're thinking of. And now let us pray as we say this prayer together. Gracious one, you know every person and every story. You are part of, of all that is. I pray now for this person and their story. I pray they might know your presence, that they may, might sense your nearness, that they might feel their burden lightened. I join my heart to their story now and I ask you to show me how else I might come alongside them, that they might know they are not alone in this. Thank you for sharing with us in all things and for giving us to one another. Amen.
blessing. A great number of the people followed him, and among them were women who were beating their breasts and wailing for him. But Jesus turned to them and said, Daughters of Jerusalem, do not weep for me, but weep for yourselves and for your children. For the days are surely coming when they will say, Blessed are the barren, and the wombs that never bore, and the breasts that never nursed. Then they will begin to say to the mountains, Fall on us, and to the hills cover us. For if they do this when the wood is green, what will happen when it is dry? Not everyone in the crowd surrounding Jesus was angry. Not everyone was shouting. Not everyone wanted to see him suffer. Our stations take us from the helping of Simon to the sorrow of these women lamenting. They were wailing for him. Mourning women played a fundamental role in Jesus' time and place, so common they could easily be ignored. Jesus, however, sees them, hears them, and addresses them. His words are not reassurance, but warning. There are even more heartbreaking days ahead. And yet Jesus, pausing from his own pain, giving his attention in spite of his own agony, is itself a kind of blessing. Mourning and blessing, lament and kindness, take up equal, equal space in this scene. Jesus even mentions the time when a usual lament will be understood as blessing. Take a pinch of salt, sprinkle it into some water, and then use your finger to swirl it around. As you do, remember the tears of the woman who followed Jesus on this path. Remember the tears shared as he looked out over the city, thinking about the things over which you have shed, and think also about the things over which you have shed tears. Your tears, your mourning, is a sign of profound care, of love. As you swirl your finger in the water, imagine your own tears mixing with others. All part of the mourning for which is broken in our world. But remember too, the blessing of care that is poured out to this world. Crucifixion. When they came to the place that is called the skull, they crucified Jesus there with the criminals, one on his right and one on his left. Then Jesus said, Father, forgive them, for they do not know what they are doing. And they cast lots to divide his clothing. Father, forgive them, for they do not know what they are doing. Can you imagine words more surprising at this time? Can you imagine words more gentle, more compassionate, more graceful? Jesus speaks these words from the cross, one of the last things he says before he dies. He speaks them not as excuse, not as denial, but as profound understanding. The people doing this do not really know what they're doing. Most are just simply following orders. Maybe they're grieving, maybe they're caught up in their crowds of emotion, maybe they are confused by the conflicting stories about who Jesus is. Because is he a promise or is he a threat? A messiah or a menace? The mechanism of state violence demand action before understanding. They crucify him. They do not know what they do. There is much we also do not know about ourselves, about each other, and especially about those we would consider strangers or even opposites. 
Following Jesus' way here is one way to orientate ourselves with grace towards all we do not know. So let's join together in a time of confession. I'll speak a prompt and then leave some silence for you to offer your own prayers. I'll close each silence by saying, God in your mercy, and you're invited to respond by saying, hear our prayers. Holy One, for where I have caused harm on my own, I ask you to forgive me and to help me forgive myself. It is sometimes true of me like it was true of those in the story. I do not know what I do. God, in your mercy, hear our prayers. And Holy One, for where I have caused harm together with others, I ask you to forgive us and to help me forgive. It is sometimes true of us like it was true of those in the story. We do not know what we do. God, in your mercy, hear our prayers. And Holy One, for where others have caused harm, I ask you to forgive them and to help me do the same. It is sometimes true of them like it was true of those in the story. They do not know what they do. God, in your mercy, hear our prayers. Amen. Promise. One of the criminals who were hanged there kept deriding him and saying, Are you not the Messiah? Save yourself and us. But the other rebuked him, saying, Do you not fear God, since you are under the same sentence of condemnation? And we indeed have been condemned justly, for we are getting what we deserve for our deeds, but this man has done nothing wrong. Then he said, Jesus, remember me. When you come into your kingdom, he replied, Truly I tell you, today you will, you will be with me in paradise. We often think that promises tell us of good to come. The men hanging beside Jesus on their own crosses didn't have a future and wished to place their hope. Jesus makes a promise to the one who addresses him. But it's not a far off fantasy. Jesus promises the man communion, belonging. You are forgiven, that's really what he's saying. Right then and there, today you will be with me in paradise. He focuses the man in the present and then he transforms the present, infusing that very moment with hope, with peace and with mercy. Paying attention to our breath is one way to centre ourselves in the present as we consider the promise Jesus makes to be with us now and until the end of the age. Let your breathing take you deeper into that promise communion. Still yourselves and breathe in hope and breathe out despair. Breathe in peace. Breathe out anxiety. Breathe in mercy. And breathe out judgment. Breathe in love. Breathe out love. Breathe in love. Breathe out love. Breathe in love. Breathe out. Breathe out love. Here. Meanwhile, standing near the cross of Jesus were his mother 
and his mother's sister Mary, the wife of Cleopas, and Mary Magdalene. When Jesus saw his mother and the, and the disciple whom he loved standing beside her, he said to his mother, Woman, here is your son. Then he said to the disciple, Here is your mother. And from that hour the disciple took her into his own home. He took her into his own home, into his own heart. This part of the story is about giving and receiving care. What Jesus has been for his mother and his friend, he cannot be any more. He knows they will mourn. He knows they will miss what he has been for them. And so he gives them to each other that they might each experience care, both the giving of it and the receiving of it. So they can share with each other what he has been for them while learning something new. The way his care for them continues even after he is gone because he has brought them together. Hold your hands out in front of you. Turn one palm up, ready to receive. Turn the other palm down, ready to give. In the silence, imagine receiving care as a tangible thing in your upturned hand. What is it that's been given to you? And now, as the silence continues, imagine giving care with your hand that is facing down. What is it that you are offering? Maybe add, to whom are you offering care? Bring your hands together. And in this last silence, offer a brief prayer of gratitude for the care you received and the care you give. Amen. Darkness. It is now about noon, and darkness came over the whole land until three in the afternoon, while the sun's light failed and the curtain of the temple was torn in two. Then Jesus, crying with a loud voice, said, Father, into your hands I commend my spirit. Having said this, he breathed his last. Darkness fell over the land like a covering like the curtain in the temple was a covering. In the hardest times, like when Jesus is on the cross, and in the most sacred places, like the Holy of Holies in the temple, reality is sometimes obscured. Clarity is sometimes sacrifice. Darkness makes space for the unknown, a sometimes beautiful, sometimes terrible allowance. When the temple curtain is torn, when that covering rips in two, the notion that God could be contained there was challenged. The holy space the curtain had concealed, had kept in darkness, was suddenly revealed. We can never build anything in our structures or our hearts that keeps God from reaching us. On a piece of paper, write down what seems to separate you from God. Maybe you will write thoughts, emotions, habits, convictions. Maybe for you there's just one thing, maybe there will be a long list. Whatever it is, take this time to write it down. And then when you're ready, take the bit of paper and rip it up. You can make one big tear like the story tells us about the temple curtain. Or you can tear your paper into lots of tiny pieces. Let the tearing be a denial of artificial boundaries and an affirmation of God's ever presence. Behind a curtain, on a cross or in the darkness, God is always with us. And we praise God that God is always with us. Burial.
When it was evening, there came a rich man from Arimathea named Joseph, who was also a disciple of Jesus. He went to Pilate and asked for the body of Jesus. Then Pilate ordered it to be given to him. So Joseph took the body and wrapped it in a clean linen cloth and laid it in his own new tomb, which he had hewn in the rock. He then rolled a great stone to the door of the tomb and went away. At this station, we witness how our friend honoured Jesus by caring for his body, treating it respectfully, tenderly, providing a place for burial. The honour given in death is a reflection of the respect felt in life, a testimony to the connection these two men shared. By offering his tomb, Joseph found a way to extend his care for Jesus even past the boundary of death. Turn to your candle. Watch it for a few moments. See how the flames flicker and dance. Observe how the light stretches and shrinks. Pay attention to the life in the candle, in the flame. Shortly the candle will be blown out. Remember, remember though what remains, even as the flame is no more. Before blowing this candle out, let us pray. I extinguish this candle, but not the flame of truth, not the light of hope, not the warmth of love. These I carry in my heart, and I know they will carry me for the days to come. Amen. We serve you and honour you in all of our ways. We ask this through Christ our Saviour. Amen. So go now, and go in peace. Amen.